Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending upon <laughs> the time zone that you are in. We are just getting started here. So um, <clears throat> we'll give a couple minutes for everyone to join. Um, but please, um, as you start to join in, please, please don't forget to sign in so that you can get your CME credit. Um, there will be a sign in link in the chat. We also ask that you please introduce yourself in the chat, who you are, where, what, where you're from, sort of your background area. Um, we would love for you all to engage as much as possible. Uh, we know everybody has busy practices, so we'd love to see you on video, but if you need to um, turn your video off, that's fine. Um, but please, please take a moment to introduce yourself. And I guess I can introduce myself to those who have started to join. So I am Dr. Tricia Kubele. I'm a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist um, at the University of Colorado and Children's Hospital Colorado in Denver. Um, and I also um, have a particular area of in expertise and interest in um, heavy menstrual bleeding and blood disorders in both adolescents and adults. And so I will be serving as your facilitator today. Um, as you all join, um, you will see there are several of us um, sort of here to support HFA and, Echo, and Project ECHO. Um, <clears throat> so just want to, again, welcome everyone. You can use the chat to introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, sort of your background area. And please, again, don't forget um, to use the link in the chat to sign in. We're going to give it maybe one or two more minutes and then we will get started uh, with our webinar today. So Janet and Michael, if you can see there, it looks like there is one question in the Q&A that says um, chat is disabled for someone. So if you guys could just look at that as we're getting going, um, hopefully we can make sure that's enabled for everyone. Um, <clears throat> give a couple more minutes for see if anyone else is going to join and then we will go ahead and get started maybe in one more minute. Thank you, Michael. It looks like the chat is open, so hopefully everyone can use that. It looks like we're getting some more people. Thank you, Helen, uh, for joining us uh, from the Tri-State Bleeding Disorder Foundation. We appreciate you being with us today. Um, so again, one more time, I'm gonna take a moment to welcome everyone. I am Dr. Tricia Hugale. I'm a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist um, at the University of Colorado in Denver and Children's Hospital. And I have a particular area of interest in heavy menstrual bleeding and blood disorders. And I am going to be serving as your um, facilitator today for <clears throat> our webinar that's going to be discussing testing for bleeding disorders in OBGYN care. Um, Please take a moment as you join to um, sign in using the link in the chat that helps you get credit for attending and <clears throat> excuse me, your CME credit. Um, please also take a moment to introduce yourself um, in the chat, uh, where you are, what you do. Um, we want you to use the chat today to ask questions about the clinical cases we're gonna be discussing. If you have your own individual clinical cases um, that you wanna talk about, please remember of course to be HIPAA compliant and not share any personal patient information, but otherwise we welcome your questions um, throughout our presentation. We also welcome you um, to turn your video on and unmute and even ask the question out loud, but you certainly can use the chat um, <clears throat> as another option. So I think with that, again, we will go ahead and get started. Today we are, this is a series of four lectures and today is our second lecture in a series that is focusing on discussing heavy menstrual bleeding and bleeding disorders. And specifically our guest speaker today, Dr. Maureen Baldwin, um, will be talking about testing for bleeding disorders in OBGYN care. <clears throat> and I am Dr. Fugle at the University of Colorado. Go ahead and advance the slide. Hi, Charity. Thank you for joining us from Kansas. 
Um, so a few housekeeping items, um, important to know um, <clears throat> that we have a disclosure statement that we wanna share with you. So Project ECHO is in compliance with ACCME standards for integrity and independence in the accredited continuing education and requires that anyone who's in a position to control the content of educational activity disclose all relevant financial relationships that they've had within the last 24 months. And you can see here below myself, um, Stormy Johnson, Dr. Christina Haley, Dr. Maureen Baldwin, who all assisted with both planning and then um, some speaking for this topic that <clears throat> they have disclosed below um, their specific involvement with various organizations and all relevant financial relationships have been uh, resolved and mitigated for the purposes of this presentation today. Um, again, please don't forget to sign in. We want you to get your credit. Really appreciate you taking time with us today. So you can use the link in the sign in the chat uh, to sign in. You can also use this QR code. Um, there will be a post session evaluation that we'll share with you at the end of the presentation, and you will need to complete that in order to fully get um, your CME credit. So um, I'd next like to introduce today's um, guest uh, speaker. Um, <clears throat> I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Maureen Baldwin, who is a wonderful colleague and friend. Um, Dr. Maureen Baldwin um, currently serves as an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon, where she completed her medical training, including a master's degree in public health and a fellowship in complex family planning. Uh, Dr. Baldwin has a practice focused designation in pediatric and adolescent gynecology, and she also serves as the co director of the interdisciplinary hematology and gynecology adolescent clinic, um, which they call their spot stops and clot clinic, uh, which treats teens with heavy menstrual bleeding. She also serves as a medical advisor for the National Hemophilia. <clears throat> Hemophilia Foundation and also for the Foundation for Women and Girls with Bleeding Disorders. Um, her research is focused on hormonal management of menstruation, also pregnancy loss, abortion safety, systems approaches to contraceptive access, and teaching with simulation. So welcome, um, Dr. Baldwin. Thank you for being with us today. And with that, um, I do want to quickly review our agenda. So we're Next, going to get started with a pre-session poll to kind of review with our group, you know, what is your background experience, background knowledge in the area, and then see if after um, Dr. Baldwin's presentation and case discussion, you know, has that changed at all, potentially uh, your knowledge and the way you would um, practice and test patients um, in your practice. Um, after we do the session poll, Dr. Baldwin will then give about a 20 minute presentation on the topic of testing in the setting of heavy menstrual bleeding and bleeding disorders. Um, we will then follow that up by walking you through a specific case and discussing a couple of case questions. Again, please very much, we invite you at that point to consider put, turning your video on, engaging in questions directly with us, engaging in questions through the chat. Um, we really wanna just help you um, optimize your clinical practice. And the more you engage and ask questions, the more we can hopefully address um, your learning needs. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll end with, again, that post-session uh, poll. Um, a post-session evaluation and then get you back on to your busy day. So um, with that, we will go ahead and share with you a brief poll. Um, you can go ahead as these questions come up, just sort of basically scroll through them, answer the questions. I think there's about four or five questions. And then once you get to the bottom, you'll be able to hit submit. So can you see the poll? Yes, I can see the poll. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Janet, just let us know when it looks like most people have submitted their answers. And we're and getting there. We can... Okay, good. I'll let you drive this part. <laughs> okay. Maybe wait a couple. 
a little bit longer to let people get through all four questions. We'll give you another 20 seconds maybe to finish up. Hmm. Looks like most people have completed. So we'll. All right, so it looks like in terms of which of the following would not be an appropriate initial screening assessment, a little bit of a um, vari variability in the responses, so which is great. Um, so hopefully something that we can kind of discuss a little bit more and maybe come to a little bit more of a general consensus, although obviously it's a hot topic to discuss. Um, in terms of which of these lab test results would be considered abnormal. Um, looks like um, the majority, well, we're about 50-50. They're all abnormal, or at least the low von Willebrand factor activity is abnormal. So again, a good topic for a discussion. Um, looks like everybody's um, in um, on the same page in terms of um, when to think about consulting a hematologist. And um, yeah, again, about, 80-20 um, in terms of this true-false statement about um, when to um, discontinue therapy. So lots to talk about, and then we'll see how people feel at the end. So with that, um, Dr. Baldwin, please um, tell us more about testing for heavy menstrual bleeding. Thank you. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, today um, for this um, short talk, I'm just going to cover the following objectives um, to identify some resources to screen and monitor both gynecologic and obstetric bleeding symptoms and, um, and to understand when to do it, um, to identify some of the standard laboratory evaluation um, as a first step to test for bleeding disorders. And this is directed primarily toward primary care providers um, as the first step or um, in the world I live in, OBGYNs, um, to identify some pitfalls of testing and referral considerations. So we get a lot of referrals for people who actually have pretty normal labs that just look abnormal. So we'll talk about how to tell the difference and then recognize some next steps in care if a bleeding disorder is suspected. And they've asked me as an OBGYN to talk about hemophilia hematology testing in a way that I hadn't really learned before. And so this really stretched my, um, my uh, ability to understand some of the lab tests that we order a lot. And so hopefully I can um, you know, display these in a way that I think other, um, other providers who are not hematologists might look at them. So first, I just want to um, talk about the situations where we might think about doing testing for a bleeding disorder. And um, one of these is with obstetric hemorrhage. Um, obstetric hemorrhage is really common, really devastating in, in some cases, and um, is something that um, we're really good at managing. Um, so we are, um, I like this little arrow because um, the amount of work that we do is sort of, um, uh, displayed by the size of the little circle. So we do very little work to screen people for their risk for obstetric hemorrhage. Maybe we ask them, did you have a hemorrhage before? Or anybody in your family have a hemorrhage with a birth? And then we do a bit to prevent hemorrhage. We try to manage labor so there's no hemorrhage. Uh, we try to understand you know, whose labor might be at higher risk of having extra bleeding. Um, and then we do a lot of work about assessment and treatment, and we do a good job with those. And then the patient gets discharged from the hospital after they somewhat recover, and we don't always find out why they had the hemorrhage. Sometimes we can identify it, but when we don't identify it, we often don't follow up very well. So this is a huge missed opportunity um, to understand um, which of the patients who have a hemorrhage might be candidates for getting testing and the best timing to do that testing. Um, and then similarly, we don't usually use the word menstrual hemorrhage very much, but I'm going to try to use it a lot. So we'll bring it into um, to terminology that we commonly use. So similarly, very little work to screen people. Um, we don't ask 10 year olds, hey, does your mom have heavy bleeding before they even have a period? So we're not really finding out who might be at risk of having uh, um, extra bleeding with their first periods. 
Um, we don't really do anything at all to prevent it other than say, hey, pack a bag of pads and make sure you have it before you start your period. And then um, we do a bit, a little bit in primary care to assess whether a teenager is having heavy bleeding and then we do a bit to treat them when they do come to care. And then we don't always test. So someone might come in and say, hey, primary care provider, um, my kid's having heavy bleeding. They might test them you know, for iron deficiency and treat their bleeding with a medication. And then that might be successful and they may never get tested for a bleeding disorder. And this is important because uh, this means that later on they may stop their treatment for some reason and then end up having um, a bleeding episode that might be more devastating. So um, these are um, important opportunities that we're missing. Um, and bleeding disorders are out there. Even if we're successfully treating and managing the bleeding, we um, we need to know if someone has a bleeding disorder. Um, the prevalence of von Willebrand's disease is one in a thousand in the general population. And the proportion of people with von Willebrand disease who are transfused before they have a diagnosis is about one in four. And, um, and this is the statistic that I think really gets a lot of us, which is that from the very first bleeding episode, the average time to diagnosis of von Willebrand's is approximately 16 years. And it's longer for um, females than males because males often have um, potentially earlier um, bleeding experiences like with circumcision or bloody noses that might bring them to care um, compared to females. Um, the proportion of teens who have heavy periods is about 20% overall. So knowing who to test among those is challenging. Um, in different populations, it could be as many as half of those teens who are actually have a bleeding disorder underlying their bleeding. Um, and the proportion of births with hemorrhage is also high. It's maybe 10% at baseline. And so how do we know which of those to test? Um, we know that people who had a prior hemorrhage at birth might, um, with a birth, might have a um, even higher chance of a repeat hemorrhage, and so um, important to find out who who had prior experiences. And then um, the proportion of those with severe hemorrhage, SPPH is severe postpartum hemorrhage, the proportion of those who have a bleeding disorder also might be as high as one in four. So these numbers let, lead to us to believe that there might be you know, one in five or um, one in four of the underlying population having a bleeding disorder mean that we should be testing more. When we look at um, obstetric bleeding, um, you know, lots of times on the discharge summary from the hospital, a, a patient might have um, postpartum hemorrhage listed, which can mean a lot of different things. It could mean they had a tiny bit of extra bleeding with a birth. It could mean they had a massive hemorrhage that with a lot of blood loss requiring a transfusion, and there's no distinction in the diagnosis. Um, but the definitions um, are um, for postpartum hemorrhage are if they had more than one liter or they had hemodynamic instability sometime in the third trimester or with the birth. Um, a severe postpartum hemorrhage would be if they had more than two liters of blood loss um, or in a first or second trimester pregnancy, a miscarriage or abortion, more, having more than 500 milliliters. And um, the reasons why people have postpartum hemorrhage or extra bleeding is are, you know, range from having a surgical injury to like a laceration of a blood vessel to having, um, you know, the uterus not want to squeeze down and lead to extra bleeding. And that's called atony. Um, most of the bleeding is due to atony, and that's not necessarily something that is uh, caused by a bleeding disorder, but could be exacerbated by one. So the predictors um, for having a bleeding disorder among people who have postpartum hemorrhage um, are, are um, mainly the amount of blood loss. So in a severe hemorrhage with more than two liters of blood loss, um, a quarter were diagnosed with a bleeding disorder in one small study. Um, and other predictors are having an unknown cause. So not having significant atony, that a difficulty of the uterus contracting, not having a significant laceration, not having a problem with the placenta coming out. Also predictors include family history and prior bleeding history, which are things we can screen for. Okay, so let's say we found somebody who has those risk factors and we wanna start doing testing um, either in the hospital as an obstetrician or as a family doctor in clinic. 
um, or maybe um, you uh, personally know somebody who's had this experience and they want to approach their provider about testing. The initial testing is pretty minimal, actually. Um, generally, we recommend doing um, a complete blood count, a ferritin, and then iron studies, which are called the TIBC and iron. Um, I find the TIBC and iron to be um, more of a, a test to help us understand how well the patient is getting iron repletion. And so they're not really helping us diagnose a bleeding disorder, but they can add to the panel for helping. So CBC and ferritin to understand the degree of anemia and iron deficiency. And then a von Willebrand disease panel. A VWD panel has three components in it. The VWF antigen, the activity, and then factor eight activity. And some labs bundle these together as a single test called the von Willebrand panel. Some labs require that you order them separately. Some labs have other names such as VWF multimers, which is not appropriate as a first line test. And, um, and so, making sure that each three of these um, is included is important because um, just having one of them alone is not enough to um, help with diagnosis. And then finally, um, doing coagulation panel um, with PT-PTT and fibrinogen. Not all labs have fibrinogen and included in the coag panel, but it can be helpful because there can be um, abnormalities with fibrinogen that lead to extra bleeding. And then um, a Biton score, which is a physical exam finding um, and so in that way, it's a test, but it's an easy test to do. It's a test you can do even on a video call. And so, um, so this is the basic workup right here. Um, Biton score um, is this physical exam um, to find out if somebody has hypermobility or um, basically are they a stretchy person? And, um, and so they include the following tests, um, you know, tests one through four are done on each on one side of the body and on the other side of the body. And then the test five is putting your palms flat on the floor. Um, so basically every yoga instructor, <laughs> but uh, not, <laughs> not, uh, not everybody. And so uh, it's pretty easy to tell right off the bat if somebody is a stretchy person by doing these tests. And then to score them, they just get one point if they can do the, the test. Um, one for each side of the body, and then an additional point if they can put their hands flat on the floor. So if um, if they have um, more than six points, then they're hypermobile, and hypermobility is um, um, uh, basically a type of bleeding disorder. Okay, so say we get the test back, and um, and they have some uh, exclamation points on them from your lab. Um, how do we know when the test is actually abnormal versus whether it's just um, you know a factor of the way the lab did the test, or maybe because uh, uh, it's you know, low when it should be high, or high when it should be low? I think this gets a bit confusing, and this is where we get a lot of referrals for things that are not actually a problem. So um, in the complete blood count, the CBC. Um, important to note that even when someone has a normal hemoglobin level, when they have a normal blood count, um, it doesn't mean that they're not iron deficient or that they haven't had chronic bleeding. And so it's easy to miss that someone is chronically iron deficient, even when they're compensating and they're making enough blood to be able to have a normal hemoglobin. So making sure we add that ferritin is really important to see the impact of the bleeding. Um, Additionally, a lot of people look at the MCV number on the CBC, which is the mean corpuscular volume, basically telling us, you know, are these cells puny or are they not? Um, so are these, um, are these blood cells getting enough iron in them to be a, you know, pretty normal size or is there not enough iron storage to be able to make a normal blood cell to have good oxygen carrying capacity? And when someone's been having acute uh, on chronic blood loss, so having maybe, for example, heavy periods that occur monthly, but then they have a good nutritional input and are able to recover in between, they might still have a normal looking blood cell um, um, and not look that puny because they're able to replete themselves, but it doesn't mean they're not having acute or heavy bleeding. Finally, um, we always want to look at the platelet number to make sure someone doesn't have a problem with low platelets like um, ITP. 
Um, but having a normal platelet number doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have a platelet dysfunction. And so, um, so numbers don't mean anything about function with platelets. And so if all the testing is normal and the platelet number is normal, but the bleeding looks like a problem with platelets, then we should be doing platelet function testing as a second step. So um, I think uh, one of the big points with CBC is that when you get a normal CBC back, it doesn't mean the patient isn't bleeding and it doesn't mean they don't have a problem with the function of their platelets. Um, and then next, ferritin. Ferritin um, is um, a measure of basically um, how much iron storage there is, but the way that your body moves iron around um, and has ferritin around and in, in intracellular and extracellular depends on whether there's inflammation going on. And I'm talking about the kind of inflammation from major stress, like a heavy bleed. Um, ferritin is mobilized so that it's measured more in the blood when there is a stress event. And so it looks falsely high, falsely elevated, when there is a stress event. So, um, so having a normal looking ferritin doesn't mean during a time of stress doesn't mean that the patient has adequate iron storage. Um, and then serum iron um, is really a measure only of the irons, uh, the day's iron intake. And so isn't that helpful for, um, for uh, looking at chronic use? Okay, on to the von Willebrand panel. This is kind of like the big slide here for all the uh, pitfalls of testing. Um, so we mentioned that there need to be the three components um, uh, uh, tested to understand if someone has von Willebrand disease. You need the antigen, the activity, and the factor eight activity. So um, the antigen is measuring how much von Willebrand factor protein that you have. The activity um, is assessing um, the function of binding to collagen or platelets. And this is where I think early on in my practice, I was super confused because some labs will give you this von Willebrand activity that's called ristocetin, or it's called collagen binding, or it's called GP1B, and all these new numbers and names come out of this test. And then you're like, am I ordering the right test? This doesn't look the same as it did last time. Um, and then it's uh, all of a sudden got something called dilute Russell Viper venom time. And it's so confusing to know, um, you know, what that means. So I just want um, providers who aren't hematologists to understand that, that those things like lupus anticoagulant, dilute Russell, Russell Viper venom, <laughs> collagen, those are all ways of figuring out how well the von Willebrand factor is working. And they're just lab tests. What we want at the end is just a percent number like von Willebrand factor activity percent. How, um, how active is the function of the von Willebrand factor? Um, and it doesn't matter which way they, uh, which one they use to try to test that. And then factor eight activity similarly is assessing the von Willebrand factor ability to bind to factor eight, and um, and we're looking for a percent there as well. All of these are acute phase reactants, so similar to ferritin under a stress event or a bleeding episode or a postpartum hemorrhage um, or an emergency department visit for a menstrual hemorrhage. All of these are going to be falsely elevated or they're going to be bumped up a bit and they may still be in the concerning range, even if they're bumped up or they may um, rise up out of the cutoff for having a diagnosis for bleeding disorder. So. Um, if we're looking at uh, percentages of 30% as being a cutoff to diagnose von Willebrand disease, they might go up to 60% or even higher. And the degree of difference um, that they rise is um, relatively uncertain still, um, but generally by multiple uh, percentage points. Um, so the biggest pitfall for providers who are gynecologists, obstetricians, primary care providers who are doing von Willebrand testing is that they're not ordering the right test. Um, they need to have all three of these tests, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes they'll get a test. They'll get a test back that's supposed to understand um, what, what the different protein amounts of the um, von Willebrand factor there are. 
And, um, and so uh, if you get a multimer test back that looks abnormal, you want to be talking to a hematologist, but generally you should not order anything that says multimers on it as a first line test. So what are we looking for? We're looking for low levels. Abnormally low levels um, um, are what is the concern. However, low levels could be a lab error. They could mean that the lab, the blood test sat around in the tube for a while before it got processed. It could mean that it got at the wrong temperature or that it wasn't mixed correctly. And so if a level is very low, um, it would need to be repeated. And similarly, if someone's having lots of bleeding, but they have um, you know, higher levels than you expect, it would, should be repeated as well. So the bottom line is that most tests need to be repeated about two or three times. Um, in the setting of heavy bleeding, just to make a confirmation. High levels, however, especially levels over 100% are not concerning. And this comes up a lot with factor eight levels. So when factor eight activity is very high, it often looks very high in the hundreds sometimes, and it will have uh, multiple red exclamation points on the lab test. And so we get a referral for a concern for factor eight elevated activity. Um, elevated factor eight activity is never a problem and shouldn't be something that needs a referral. It's an extreme acute phase reactant. Um, and then coagulation testing, um, pitfalls of the PTINR, PTT um, are that we're looking for abnormal levels that are high, low levels are not concerning. And for fibrinogen, um, generally it's not on all coag panels and so it can get left out. It's also another acute phase reactant as well. Um, but uh, just to know that uh, it could be helpful in cases where we can't figure out what's going on. So next question that comes up is the ideal timing of testing. So, um, you know, we'd rather have the patient with us. We know they just had an acute bleeding event. We want to work them up. We want to know, um, you know, do they, warrant, do they warrant a referral to a hematologist or do they need to be, keep, you know, have a close eye on them? Um, the ideal timing would be that they're not having acute stress, that they didn't just have a transfusion, that the test is being done at the appropriate location, uh, um, ideally, usually a university laboratory setting where they, the, or a hospital lab where they can um, perform the test correctly under the right conditions and at the right timing. Um, ideally, the patient wouldn't be using any hormonal therapies that might impact the von Willebrand factor levels. Ideally, they wouldn't have been using any um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or other um, medications that could impact platelet function. And so um, it's hard to find these ideal timings <laughs> um, for in, in even the best of cases. But um, in reality, um, any time is better than waiting. If we can get an initial test that shows us that a von Willebrand factor activity level is extremely high, that would be very reassuring. And if it was moderate, then we would know we would need to repeat it. Um, and then uh, I know all, um, all of you who responded got this correct on the initial pretest, but um, we don't need to stop hormonal therapy just to test. Um, we would recommend the patient continues their therapy, and um, which impacts the testing very little. So when would you uh, raise your eyebrows? Um, and this would be like a really raised eyebrow for me for most of these. Um, when would you really want to make sure that we did not let this pass by. So a hemoglobin less than 12. Um, so uh, uh, that would be anemia. Um, when I ask emergency room providers, um, especially pediatric emergency room providers, uh, what, what hemoglobin number would raise their eyebrows, they all say six, but that's like the patient really needs a transfusion. I think hemoglobin of 12 should raise our eyebrows because that's when the patient needs evaluation and testing and management. A ferritin less than 15 would really raise my eyebrows. That needs management, that needs treatment, and that, and that means that they're having chronic bleeding. Um, however, I wouldn't hesitate to treat a ferritin that was less than 30 to 50. A von Willebrand factor level, either activity or antigen or factor eight level less than 30 would definitely raise my eyebrows. That would be someone who really needs to see a hematologist for repeat testing to make sure that it's done correctly. 
and um, and they possibly may have a bleeding disorder. Levels in the 30 to 50 percent range are also going to raise my eyebrows. Those ones are also going to need to be repeated, especially in a patient with heavy bleeding. And then I actually have my eyebrows raised even up to the 70% um, level because um, in the patients I'm seeing, they all have bleeding. And so um, when there's heavy bleeding and the levels aren't over 100%, I'm always wanting to repeat testing. Um, and then uh, a prolongation of the coagulation test, APTT or INR, more than 35 would raise eyebrows as well. So that just means that it's taking longer for bleeding to stop. And um, so prolonged um, coagulation tests, more than 35. Okay, hematologists are friendly. That's the bottom line I would like to make sure everyone has as a takeaway today. They're always happy to answer questions. They do it nicely. Um, you should um, think about um, doing a, a chat, a curbside, or a real formal consultation when there are lower abnormal lab levels when there's um, prolonged coagulation testing, when there's significant anemia, especially when things don't always add up, like maybe they didn't have super heavy periods or they didn't have a, any um, prior hemorrhage and during pregnancy, their hemoglobin level is you know really low. Um, that could signify something else going on. Um, if there, if there's abnormal bleeding, even when you, your initial lab tests look normal, if there's iron deficiency that's not responding to oral therapy, if there's abnormal bleeding with a strong family history, and even if there's just a strong family history, but you're not sure about the amount of bleeding or about the lab test, that's still a reasonable referral. Um, consider um, an e-consult. Many of our institutions have um, an electronic consult version in our uh, electronic medical record that allows us to just send the lab test, send the question, and then find out what the next step should be rather than waiting for the patient to have an appointment. Um, and, um, and then as we create our relationships with our friendly hematologists, we sometimes can just ask them questions nicely. And they're all pretty active on social media, so you can also find them there. Um, so when the hematologist sees the patient, um, they're typically um, repeating the von Willebrand panel and um, sometimes two or three times. Um, one of the things I've learned is that they're frequently looking to make sure that roughly the numbers are similar to each other. So if the activity level um, and the antigen level for, for von Willebrand factor come back significantly different, then that gives them a tip off that the test probably wasn't done correctly. If they're both low and different, it could also mean some other crazy scenarios. But um, I think they're really looking to see that they follow each other. And if they don't, then that's a tip off that they need to be repeated. Um, also, they may be um, timing and doing platelet function evaluation, and in some institutions, this requires a scheduled test, and the patient really needs to be off any ibuprofen and um, be under the right conditions and not have exercised recently, et cetera. So um, scheduling the platelet function evaluation could be a little bit more of a, um, of a I'm not going to say ordeal, but like a, a, an event. And so, um, so they um, may be putting time into doing that. Um, they um, may be doing specific coagulation factor assays, so a factor 11 or a factor, um, a factor 7 or, you know, some other factors that might be a tip-off based on the family history in particular. Um, and then they might also be doing genetic testing to find out a little bit more about um, uh, the specific uh, uh, bleeding disorder that they're um, targeted toward. Um, so again, we, we rarely make a diagnosis based on one test. So if you're out there as a primary care provider doing um, initial lab tests and you get really low levels, we don't want you to tell the patient that they have a bleeding disorder. We want you to tell them that there's a suspicion for one, that there's a concern with their lab test that needs repeat. Because many times they come to us and they actually don't have a problem or the levels are only marginal, especially after their stress event is resolved. Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't give people a false impression of having a problem when they don't necessarily. Um, a, 
Additionally, the implications of having a bleeding disorder doesn't change the options for management, doesn't change the way we treat obstetric hemorrhage, doesn't change the way that we treat menstrual uh, management in most settings. It, getting a diagnosis does give us, give us some additional options for helping bleeding and making plans, um, especially for future surgical bleeding, but it doesn't change our current management. We should still continue to do that the way that we normally do. We might tell the patient to uh, hold off on having a surgery or uh, hold off on taking anti-inflammatory medications that might impact their platelets. Um, we might advise a child to make sure they wear a helmet as we always do, um, or to maybe, you know, maybe wait on that more aggressive um, uh, activity for a little bit until we get a diagnosis. Then we'll also be um, connecting the patient to the nearest hemophilia treatment center or hemostasis and thrombosis center. And, um, and then we, we should be providing um, resources for providers. And so one resource um, to know about is, um, for example, the Foundation for Women and Girls Plus with Blood Disorders, FWGBD has a lot of resources for providers, for example, on management of iron deficiency or management of heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, screening for a bleeding disorder, et cetera, um, and those are available online. Um, I like to just end by um, reminding people um, to um, just incorporate in your routine primary care um, some initial screening that could just be as easy as, do you or a family member have problems with extra bleeding? Or um, have you ever had extra bleeding after a surgery or getting a tooth pulled or, or with um, pregnancy or periods? And those questions can help target whether we need to be asking more in-depth questions um, to find out who might be at highest risk or who might benefit from, um, from the initial round of testing. Um, all right, I'll um, end it here and pass it back to... Um, uh, to our coordinators for the post-session poll. Wonderful. Thank you, Maureen. That was a great presentation and review. And I love just in particular all the tips and tricks and tidbits um, and sort of the experiences that we see all the time in terms of how to interpret testing. I think that's so valuable. Thank you all um, for joining us today. We really do appreciate your engagement. Um, if you like this topic and you want to hear others, um, our third um, presentation in this series um, will happen on October 28th, where we're Dr. Christina Haley, um, who's a <clears throat> Well, um, researched and experienced hematologists in this area will be talking about iron deficiency and OBGYN care, um, not only first um, assessing and diagnosing, but then equally, if not more importantly, treating and our various options for oral and IV iron therapy. So I um, hope you will join us uh, for that presentation next month. Um, and with that, thank you all so much. Feel free to um, hop off and move on your day. But again, thank you so much for joining us today.